The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Good afternoon, everybody. My presentation is titled Financial Modeling of uh, Reinforced Concrete Beam Strengthening with Pre-Stressed Near Surface Mounted Carbon Fiber Reinforced Polymer Strips Subjected to Severe Environmental Condition. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Mr. Hamid Omran, who did this uh, work as part of his uh, PhD uh, study. So the content of the presentation, first I will start with a very brief introduction and the research objectives. I will briefly talk about the experimental program, the test matrix, the material property, the environmental exposure, and the long-term sustained load uh, loading. Then move to this uh, numerical simulation about the FE model of the pre-stress uh, beam that uh, were subjected to accelerated environmental uh, exposure and sustained load. Finally, with a uh, conclusion pertaining to what I'll present in this presentation. So, uh, for those who are not familiar with the fiber enforced polymer uh, strengthening techniques, the FRP then used uh, strengthened structural uh, members for flexure and shear uh, of reinforced concrete beams, slabs, and columns. There are uh, two techniques currently for, uh, to strengthen uh, and repair using FRP. The first one is the externally bonded FRP sheet or strips or plates, uh, where the uh, material is bonded on the tension side of the uh, member and then the other one is a near surface mounted uh, FRP uh, can be rod or strips uh, in, uh, in a way that you make a groove in the concrete on the tension side, you fill the groove with epoxy and then you mount the FRP rebar or strips inside the groove. So both uh, techniques can be used as a non-pre-stress or pre-stress material and this shows the uh, sch schematic uh, sketch of the cross-section of the beam, you can see the groove uh, and then the uh, rebar or the strips. You can have more than one groove depending on the level of strengthening that you are uh, requesting. When compared with externally bonded, uh, the NSM present uh, more advantages, uh, such as you can achieve higher level of strengthening efficiency, and then uh, in terms of the installation, uh, it is faster. The process of strengthening is faster. Even though you require to do the cut in the groove using the diamond concrete saw, but you don't have to do all the surface preparation other than just washing the groove. You can also have, uh, by using NSM, uh, there is a higher uh, protection against the fire, mechanical damage, the aging, and vandalism because the material is embedded right now in the concrete. In, in contrary to the external bond that is exposed to the uh, outside. However, as I mentioned, both techniques can use as a pre-stress and non-non-pre-stress, but the more uh, application is the using of the non-pre-stress. However, in order to improve the effectiveness of the FRP, you, you better to use it as a pre-stress material before bonding to the concrete uh, uh, surface. And then this allowed the FRP to contribute to both the uh, service and the ultimate load bearing uh, situation. And it can help also to close the existing cracks and delay the formation of new cracks. The pre-stressing pre FRP is very promising techniques, as I mentioned in the, pre the previous few slides about the advantage. But it required the development of uh, an accurate system that you can use to pre-stress the material against the, the member itself. Uh, I will not talk about the system that we developed because it's outside the scope of this presentation. So uh, the, 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 the research program was very extensive and then we did so many things and then uh, uh, it was related to investigating the flexural behavior of uh, RCB in the with NSM. Uh, we developed an anchorage system to grab the, uh, the rebar or the strips and then to apply the pre-stressing against the beam itself. Uh, we looked at different pre-stressing levels, uh, different geometry for the FRP reinforcement strips versus the rods, 
uh, we did the test under static loading, fatigue loading, and then long-term sustained loading, as well the environmental exposure, and then we did numerical analytical simulation. So what I present today is just the numerical simulation for the beam that were uh, subjected to uh, environmental exposure and under sustained load. So only portion of the research will be presented today. So the outline of the presentation that what I'll cover is that the numerical simulation on the 3D nonlinear FE simulation of pre-stress and SM CFRP beams, strengthened beams, and predict the load deflection response of the beams after deterioration due to the free throw exposure and sustained load. So just let me give you a brief overview about the experimental program. Uh, what I'm presenting today is the result of uh, five beams. The first one is the uh, control without any strengthening. The second one is the beam with the uh, with done pre-stress reinforcement, uh, FRP, and then those are three beams with different level of free stressing as we can see here. So uh, we had to use two strips uh, uh, and then they were subjected to 500 cycles. Uh, three, three cycles per day between minus 34 to plus 34 with fresh water spray for about 10 minutes at temperature uh, is 20 uh, degrees Celsius. The level of the sustained load was about 47 of the ultimate load of the uh, beam that is strengthened with non pre stress FRP. The property of the concrete, I will talk later about how we determine the one uh, subjected to free throw exposure. <coughs> So this showed the test setup uh, and geometry of the beams. The beams were uh, uh, five meter long uh, center to center span under a two point load. And this showed the cross section uh, on the bottom left hand side of the uh, reinforced concrete beam and then the uh, groove where we had the strips. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we used two strips. And the reason we had to do two strips because in the other beams that were uh, strengthened with the rod, we needed to have the same axial stiffness. So. In order to uh, have this, we had to put two strips side by side. And uh, this <coughs> showed the property of the material. Uh, the strips were two by 16 millimeter, and then the tensile strengths from the manufacturer as well from the testing we did are very close, as well the ultimate uh, strain and the model plasticity. The environmental exposure, uh, we have a very uh, uh, unique uh, environmental chamber. It's a walk-in chamber that is about 10 by 3 by 3 meters. We put the beams that were 5 meters long inside the chamber, and we showed the beams uh, under the sustained load. And then the free throw cycling exposure, um, I called it accelerated 500 cycles, uh, between minus 34 plus 34. At one cycle, about every 9 hours and a half, this took about seven months. That is correlated to about 13 years. So that's why we, we call it accelerated. The free throw cycling exposure was selected. This temperature was selected based on the maximum and minimum mean, mean average value and then the mean relative humidity according to the Canadian Hardware Vision Design Code. The figure on the right hand side shows the uh, program, the temperature as well, that which is shown in the dotted red line. And then the solid the black line shows the temperature, the actual measure A temperature as well. We had thermocouple inside the concrete that we measured the concrete in the core, the temperature in the core of the concrete. Uh, this shows the beams inside the chamber. The, uh, the frame was a self-reacting frame. I won't go into detail about this, but you can see we loaded the beams uh, with the two-point <coughs> two load in the longitudinal direction. The, this, the photo at the bottom right-hand side, this is uh, after the seven months, and the one on the right-hand side, uh, left-hand side, is before. So you can see the degradation of the uh, concrete the beams. We, we had cylinders, but we were not able to test cylinders because there was nothing left out of them. So we had to do other uh, techniques to measure the compressive strength of the uh, concrete. Okay, so this is a close-up view of those beams, and then uh, this showed the uh, significant deterioration, uh, the uh, cracks uh, in the beams, uh, the thermal cracks uh, from the sustained load and the environmental exposure. Uh, some of the beams uh, that were strengthened with the pre-stress, we can see some debonding between the epoxy and the concrete very close to the anchors uh, at the end. <coughs> So uh, this shows actually a comparison of the beams on the left-hand right, left side 
where the one without any sustained load and the one with the uh, on the right hand side the beans were the sustained load and just showing this to uh, so that you can see the, the effect of the sustained load and this is before testing to failure so we can see that the crack pattern under sustained load were more severe than the one without sustained load although both were subject to the same environmental exposure so this is the beam uh, after uh, failure after testing to failure the old beams uh, failed by crushing of the concrete uh, and then uh, debonding uh, uh, sorry rupture of the FRP that was for, uh, that was right after uh, the yielding of the internal reinforcement. <clears throat> so in terms of numerical simulation uh, for the modeling, some assumption that uh, we took advantage of the symmetry in the geometry and the loading. The self-weight was also included. The mode of failure was defined according to the material property, uh, whether concrete crushing or uh, rupture of the uh, FRP, whichever occurred first. The loading was applied in four load steps. Uh, initial uh, the first one is the initial stress to enforce the pre-stressing and then after pre-stressing to cracking, the uh, cracking to yielding and yielding to failure. The pre-stressing in the FRP was uh, applied in, we used the ANSYS software as advised using the equivalent temperature method and to enforce the pre-stressing in the uh, NSM FRP. In terms of the uh, elements for the concrete, we use solid 65 element, 3D structure solid element, 8 node, 3 degree of free, uh, freedom at each node. It has a capability of plastic deformation, cracking in the uh, orthogonal direction, crushing. And as you can see on the bottom right hand side, that there is another layer of the concrete. So when we did the uh, test on the concrete strengths and the, from the observation and inspection of the exposed uh, beam, we look at the severity of that surface and then we find that the concrete on the side had lower strength than the concrete at, this, at the top. So we, uh, sorry, at the top was lower, had lower strength than the concrete on the side of the beam and even the core. So we had to model the concrete into three different uh, stressing curves for the top, for the mid, for the side and for the, for the core of the concrete section. For the strips, uh, the epoxy, the anchor, the plate loading, we use solid 45. And then also they have the, the capability of signing initial strain. Uh, and then the, the curves at the bottom shows the uh, actual stress strain curve for the strips. And then for the epoxy, we use two different types of epoxy. One of them was to bond the strip to the steel anchor. And the other one to bond the strips or the FRP to the concrete surface. <coughs> The steel uh, reinforcement uh, was modeled using the uh, 3D spar element and it showed the property of the steel stress strain curve of the steel that uh, on the tension side on the uh, top side, uh, compression side. Uh, the yield was, I believe, uh, reduced to about 26% for the environmental exposure. The bolts that were used at the end of the anchors to anchor the strips to the concrete were modeled using the 3D elastic beam, beam element and then uh, the element has a rotation about the XY axis, uh, capability of tension, compression, torsion, uh, bending, and so on. <coughs> so this is interesting about the concrete epoxy uh, uh, interface. So uh, we uh, use target 170 element, which is to represent 3D target surface for the association con contact element. This is on the concrete, and then the contact 173 that represents the contact and sliding between the 3D target surface and the, the former surface uh, defined by this arm. So the debonding was considered uh, for the exposed uh, beam uh, and it was simulated using uh, contact pair uh, and cohesive zone material. So, uh, and this is by considering what we can see on the bottom uh, uh, of the slide, the uh, bond slip model and the normal stress gap uh, model because if you only consider one of them, you won't get what you, what you want. So if you only consider the shear stress slip model, this will lead to an interface mode of separation where the slip dominate the separation normal to the interface or to the gap. And then just by considering the tension stress gap uh, model, this will lead to a mode of failure where the gap dominate the slip at the interface. So defining the debonding according to only one of this is not, uh, and, and ignoring the other one, uh, may lead to a difference in terms of the actual what actually happened in reality. So the bilinear st uh, shear stress slip and normal stress gap uh, model are defined based 
on the appropriate uh, fracture energy of the concrete epoxy interface. This uh, slide shows the meshing and then uh, uh, again uh, we refined the mesh in the groove uh, in order to separate the fine mesh and the groove to the coarse mesh in the concrete and then uh, the, we did the sensitivity analysis the number of elements were around 14,000. Okay, so in terms of the uh, in terms of the uh, results, so this graph here or this slide shows the uh, result in terms of the load deflection for the five beams. The one at the top, uh, right left hand side, this one is for the uh, unstrengthened concrete beam, and we can see that there is a good correlation between the blue curve, which is experimental, and the red curve, which is from the FE. Uh, although the FE was uh, stiffer than the uh, than the ex uh, sorry the experimental load deflection was stiffer than the ex uh, than the predicted one in all the curves. If you look at all the curves, you can see up to yielding the experimental was stiffer than the analytical. So the increase in the stiffness might be uh, due to a result of a creep of the concrete, which makes the concrete material stiffer at the region that are not subjected to the uh, environmental exposure, which is the core of the concrete. So the concrete material showed higher modulus and lower stiffness than the unexposed beam, which is sound, uh, it's a little bit uh, um, sound uh, uh, heavy on. So the increase in the modulus elasticity is a result of the creep and wet uh, uh, condition. And then uh, this was uh, the result that the concrete material got stiffer when it undergoes uh, creep. And the similar observation were reported in the literature by other researchers uh, on, the strengthen on strengthening beams with FRP subjected to uh, free flow exposure. So, uh, and then uh, it should be mentioned that uh, finding the amount of the possible increase in the concrete stiffness or the modular elasticity was not possible in the test and uh, it was not considered in the FE model. If you look at the other curve that uh, showed the uh, strengthened beam, the one without any pre-stressing, which is this one, again, good correlation up to the ultimate. However, for those that were strengthened with the pre-stress, we can see that uh, the ultimate load were higher. And then uh, this can be explained by that uh, uh, in the experimental there were some debonding observed at the end of the uh, uh, NSM strips uh, for the pre-stress beam where we had high shear stresses and then where the effect of the exposure was more severe and then led to debonding and this ended up with the lower de uh, bond strength. So the, the, we can see that the ultimate was higher in the FE and then it's still more uh, investigation has to go through uh, the beams and then see how we can uh, how we can model that uh, part and uh, related to the debonding uh, this shows actually the uh, again from the ex from the experimental result that in this table I won't go into through this that the, the ultimate yield the deflection and the curvature and the deformation. So uh, this compared the experimental and numerical energy absorption. The one at the top is for the uh, up to yielding. And this is was calculated as the area under the low deflection curve up to yielding. And we see that there is a good correlation uh, up to yielding. However, for the ultimate, uh, up to ultimate, as I mentioned, the correlation was not that, uh, uh, was not good compared to uh, between the experimental and, and the numerical for the same reason I explained earlier. So, uh, just to wrap up about the conclusion pertaining to what I presented today, that modeling the strip with the, uh, with the element uh, solid 45 in it that has the capability of assigning initial stress and using the temperature, the, uh, temperature, uh, uh, the equivalent temperature method uh, uh, is a reliable method to enforce the pre-stressing effects. And then uh, the comparison we performed between the, the low uh, and the low deflection between the FE and the experimental showed an acceptable result, acceptable matching result uh, up to yielding, but after yielding, the trend of the predicted curve was not in a very good agreement or correlation with the experimental one. So with this, I will end uh, my presentation by acknowledging the support from uh, the industrial partner, University of Calgary and ANSWER. And thank you for attention. If you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer.